Hi, everybody. We are going to read chapter three of Shaking the Nickel Bush. Chapter three is called Movie Location. I had been worried ever since I saw those city slickers shooting off orders and strutting around in their fancy cowboy outfits. I was even more worried after I'd signed the form saying I'd do whatever the bosses told me to. Riding in horse falls was bound to be dangerous at best, and if the men who were bossing the show didn't know anything about horses and riding, it could be murder. So the first question I asked Ted Hawkins was, who'll be my boss if I do any riding here, and how will I know I'm going to get paid? That paper I signed said, Ted glanced both ways and dropped his voice. It don't make no never mind what that contract says, he told me. They're so far over the barrel for boys that'll tackle rough spills that they're hurting bad. There's talk going round that they're running shy on cash. You'll be your own boss man if you can stick it out and don't get busted up too quick. And I reckon that trick riding you done when you was a kid will save you a lot of grief. Make your dicker before every ride and collect it before you make another one. They'll squeal like hogs with their balls caught in the barn door, but you'll be the boy that's got a hold of the door handle. The overhead on this layout is 5000 a day, whether they shoot a foot of film or not. It takes a lot of high-action footage to get the kind get that kind of seed back, and they can't cut the chunk unless they hold on to boys that'll take the rough tumbles. Of course, every dude with a red hanky round his neck will be yelling orders at you, but don't pay him no heed. I'll be giving orders at the takeoff. They sure must have to take a slew of pictures if they're over the barrel for riders, I told him. I saw at least 60 cowhands and 30 or 40 Indians in the grub line. Them ain't fall riders. Them's yellow bellies, Ted told me, and he spit it out as if he'd bitten onto something rotten. Leastways, the white ones is. Most of them engines has guts enough, but you can't hire engines to ride horse falls. Government agent won't let you. Most of them white ones is extras, half-baked actors the outfit fetched along from Hollywood. Didn't, didn't you take note of their fancy chaps and pearl-handled six-guns and Spanish boots? All they do is ride along to make scenery. The engines was fetched along, too. Don't dare use the local ones. They're like as not to forget it ain't a real war and somebody'd catch an arrow in the butt. I didn't know much about California, but I did know they had mountains and deserts out there, and that would give them about the same kind of background scenery. If most of the help was from over there, I couldn't see any sense in the outfits coming way over into Arizona to take their pictures, so I asked, why in the world did they bring the whole works over here? Wouldn't it have been cheaper to take their pictures closer to home? Ted spit at a clump of cactus and growled, use your head, kid. Arizona's a new state and ain't got too many laws yet. California's an old one, and they've got these cruelty-to-animal laws over there. The way they throw these old crowbaits there ain't one in ten don't get a busted neck or a busted leg, poor devils. But one thing I will say for the outfit, they keep a sharpshooter right handy. Put them out of their misery in a hurry. A boy in Phoenix told me they th threw them with wires, I said, but he didn't know how it worked. Come on out to the strip and I'll show you, Ted told me. It ain't a bad idea for you to know how it works before you take your first spill. Ted led me out to a fairly level, gravelly place at the far end of the mesa, where there were more different kinds of cactus than I'd ever heard of, and as we went along he told me the names of all the different ones. I've forgotten the names of a good many, but I remember there being giant saguaros that stood twenty or more feet tall. In the twilight they looked like sentinels, some of them with a pair of side branches that looked like arms lifted up toward heaven in prayer. Scattered between the, st the stunted palo verde trees, yucca plants taller than my head, mesquite and creosote bushes, there were clumps of ocotillo cactus that looked like writhing snakes balanced on their tails. Here and there staghorn chalas, some of them grown to trees ten feet high, stretched out naked branches that looked in the twilight as if their ends were festooned with silvery lichen. When we came closer I could see that the lichen was a mass of hanging twigs, each covered with a million needle-sharp spines. Strewn in clumps and patches across the gravel there were hedgehog chala, prickly pear, fish hook, and beaver tail cactus. As we rounded a clump of wind-gnarled palo verde trees, I saw half a dozen heavy blocks of concrete lined up in a row. Bolted to the top of each block there was what looked to be a giant fishing reel, wound tightly with a fine steel wire. Them's the trippers, Ted told me as he picked up a wire with a stout little hook and twisted onto the end of it. Your horse will be wearing a shoe on his near forefoot with a ring welded to the heel. This here hook gets pinched tight into the ring so it can't get shook loose, and the spool's left to spin free while the cowboys chase the engines past the cameras. Take note of the saw teeth on the rims of the spool, and that pair of iron hooks that's hinged atop the spool. Well, when the director spots you right where he wants you in front of a camera, he'll give a high sign, and the trigger man will drop the hooks. 
With a forefoot yanked out under him, your cayuse will somerset in the air, and look like as not he'll land on his back. How and where you land will depend on what kind of horseman you are, and how many bad spills you've lived through before you came here. I've lived through some pretty bad ones, I told him, but never where there was any such mess of cactus as there is around here. That's why I fetched you out here, he told me. Did you take note of which shoe the wire gets hitched to? Near four, I said. So? So the pony will somersault quartering to the left, I told him. Ted slapped me on the shoulder and said, now you're using your noggin, but there's other things you'll need to know. The cameras will be on that side so as to make the most out of the fall, and they'll follow you as you fly so as to leave out the pony if he happens to get his neck broke. There ain't no director that's fool enough to dump you where the cameraman will have to make his shot through a mess of mesquite or ocotillo or staghorn chala. But there is them that's dirty enough to dump you into a mess of low cactus, especially if they figure you're making your last ride anyways. Will the wire be loose enough that I can rain out around that kind of spot, I asked. You ain't gonna rain out around nothing no place, he told me. If you're a cowboy, you'll have a six-gun in each hand, or an old musket in both of them, shooting black powder blanks at the engines. And don't forget, kid, drop them guns quick when your pony falls away. Freeze onto one and land with it in your hands and you'll be a goner. If you're an engine, you'll need both hands for bow and arrow, but that don't make no never minds, because you can't see where you're going no ways. You'll be turned half around shooting arrows with rubber tips back over the cowboys' heads. That's why the outfit will pay double for them falls. But what I set out to tell you was this. You gotta use your knees and your weight to put your cayuse where you want him. And you don't and if you don't keep him where there's clear ground on your left, especially when you're in the range of a camera, you'll get messed up something awful. The devil of it of it is is you'll never know what kind of nag you'll get or how he'll guide with knee pressure. Worst first is the way they pick the fall horses. And here is a picture of an Indian falling from a horse. Well, I said, I haven't got much weight to swing a horse with. At double the pay, it sounds to me as if I'd be smarter to take Indian falls, and I wouldn't have any saddle to get hung up in, and... Don't get no foolish notions in your head, Ted told me. Going into a fall backwards and not being able to see where you're at or where you're going to land is dangerous as dynamite. That's why you see danged few engines ponies hit the ground in the movies. Mostly the riders just heave their arms up like they was hit and take a dive off the side of the pony's neck. Then they slide on down and roll clear as the nag hightails out of camera range. There ain't an engine on the lot that can't do that real good, and they don't get no extra pay for it. Twilight had turned to night while we were talking there by the trip reels, but the stars had come out so bright that it hadn't grown much darker. After we'd started back toward the tent village, I asked, is that strip you showed me the toughest one they've got? Lord no, Ted told me. That's the easiest one, but the one they've had to use the most. Didn't you take note of the, how the ground was all tromped up? Have to keep the cameras off in it or moving fast enough the tracks won't show in the pictures. Let's mosey around the rim over here. I'll show you a set they've spent 10000 on and ain't shot a foot of film on it yet. Can't find nobody around here that'll risk taking a fall on it. Don't know what's happened to the young bucks nowadays. Less than all the good ones is off to war. The outfit might have to bring stuntmen out here from Hollywood to take the falls on this new set, and they won't get them boys for no 10 or $15 a ride. We'd walked a hundred yards or so along the edge of the mesa when Ted stopped and said, There she is. Ain't that a beauty? But I've took spills down a lot worse places than that when I was a cowhand, working for 30 a month. I'd taken a couple myself on hillsides nearly as steep and when I was only a youngster, but I hadn't done it on purpose or when a horse had a foreleg jerked out from under him so he'd somersault on top of me, or where there were boulders half the size of a chicken house. Even in the starlight, I could see that the place Ted was showing me was steeper than a church roof. And there goes an airplane. Let's wait for it to pass. All right. The ground was littered with loose stones, and all the way to the bottom the side of the mesa was studded with cactus, brush, mesquite, and boulders, with three or four saguaros that looked as solid as granite pillars. I guess I'm yellow, I told Ted. That looks to me like the best place on earth for a man to commit suicide. That's what it's meant to look like, he said, but I'd as leave take a tumble on it as on that one we just left. Them boulders is all made out of canvas and paint. Was you to fall onto one of them, it would crumble like a cream puff. Every jagged rock and them bigger in your fist has been picked off the ground and the worst of the stickers scun off in the cactus. You see them staghorn trees and yuccas down yonder? Ain't a one of them but's been dug up and set back in loose. Bump one and it would topple over like a ten pin. Here your pony don't get throwed in a tight somerset, he'll be quick-tripped by a cross-wire and turned loose to make a longer fall. 
Even at that, the place looked pretty dangerous, particularly with the kind of horses I'd seen in the Ramuda. If I'd ridden over the edge at the dead run, a horse with bad knees would be almost sure to fall in somersault when he landed. Or if there were any others behind, one of them could easily stumble and come down on top of a man. After I'd thought about it for a couple of minutes, I asked, could a man pick his horse for taking a shot at this layout? I'd make you that promise, Ted answered. Could I be sure of being last to go over the edge? I'd be bossing the job and I ain't plumb stupid, kid. I'd be watching out for you. And you wouldn't have to take off on the dead run, neither. I waited another minute and asked, what'll they pay for taking a spill down this one? Ted squinted an eye and looked up at the stars for a couple of seconds. Might go 25 without too much squawking, he told me. Might go as high as 30 was you to make the real showy fall. Think they'd go to 50? I asked. Ted thought a minute and then shook his head. Uh-uh, he told me. Might stretch it another five if they figured they could get a few more falls out of you, but they wouldn't go for the half century. They'd get stuntmen out from the coast for they'd crack through the 50. Word spreads too easy. The other boys might hang out for big money on the flat strips. What are they getting now, I asked. Ten. Maybe fifteen where the ground's roughest. Anywhere's for up to fifty for... Up, excuse me. Anywhere's up to twenty for an engine fall. They don't run on... But they don't run them on bad ground. Is morning soon enough to make up my mind? Soon enough any time, if you don't mind paying board, he said. But was I you? I'd think a lot about tackling this layout. It ain't no worse than the others if a man keeps his head about him. And if he could hang on for half a dozen falls, he'd make a pretty good stake. Ted and I didn't talk about horse falls anymore that evening. On the way back to our tent, we talked mostly about Colorado and the Littleton Roundup and High Beckman and a few other cowhands we had both known. After we got back to the tent, Ted was too busy to talk to me. While we'd been gone, a scout whom the outfit had sent up to Wyoming to find fall riders had come in with 14 recruits. He must have scoured the whole state to find them. There, there was no doubt about their being working cowhands, and I never saw a tougher-looking 14 all in one bunch. They were all in their late 20s or early 30s, and every one of them was as stout and wild as a longhorn bull. And somewhere along the line, they'd got hold of a gallon of corn squeezings. When we came into the big tent, they were shooting craps in the middle of the dirt floor, whooping and yelling like a band of drunken Indians. Ted was still trying to break up the game and get them into bed when I went to sleep. The Wyoming boys were still half drunk the next morning, and four or five of them were uglier than grizzly bears. They seemed to be looking for trouble with anybody who didn't belong to their own gang, and a couple of fist fights were in full swing before I could get my boots and breeches on. There wasn't a man in that tent who couldn't have knocked me for a loop with a single punch, so I ducked out as quick as I could and headed for the grub line. I'd been in the chuck tent 15 or 20 minutes when the rest of Group 3 came in, and among them there were half a dozen guards with night sticks in their hands. I was just getting up to leave when they came in, but Ted saw me and motioned for me to sit down again. And here are the men from Wyoming getting themselves into trouble. Over the cactus. Most of the Wyoming boys took nothing but coffee as they passed the serving counter, then sat down at a table near the end of the line and fired insults at the rest of our group as the boys went past to a table further on. Ted waited until the last man was seated, then brought a cup of coffee over and sat down beside me. You lay off this morning, kid, he told me. With these 14, along with the 12 that was already here when you come, there'll be all the riders that's needed and some to spare. The way these boys are head up, there's bound to be some mighty rough goings on out there, and there ain't no sense in you getting mixed up in it. Them Wyoming bucks is out to make the rest of you look yellow, and the way them fights went this morning, they ain't going to have an easy time of it. Are you going to put them on that new set, I asked? Wouldn't be no sense in that, he told me. Not till a few busted arms and legs get some cooled out a mite. Paired up the way they are now that hit the rim on a dead run and four noontime I'd have them all stove up into kindling wood. They're already fighting amongst themselves for the first shots at riding engine falls, and I ain't gonna tell them no different. Might as well leave the outfit Might as well leave the outfit get some high action footage for all that corn liquor wears off. Now I'll tell you what you do, kid. You shag on out to that set where we was last night. There'll be four or five crews setting up cameras along the strip so striders won't know where to expect a spill. Pick the third camera from this end and hunker down in a clump of brush where you'll be out of shutter sight, but you can see everything going on along the strip. Keep your eye peeled, and you ought to pick up some stuff that'll keep, help you about getting hurt too bad when your turn comes. A man learns by mistakes, but in this game, that's too late if the mistakes are his own. Ted didn't give me a chance to thank him, but stood up and shouted, Come on there, group three, get that grub into you. We're due at makeup in ten minutes. And that is the end of chapter three. Bye-bye, everybody.